see if I can read that. One. <laughs> and we're live. It's always sucky, right? <laughs> Technology. Welcome to the center of weirdness for the entire planet. This is Nightmare 365 Radio. What's up, everybody? My name is Matt. I got Greg here with me. As always, the skeptical sidekick that he is known as. And I guess that makes me Marshall Teller. You're Marshall Teller? Well, that's a topic for another day. But anyway, consider subscribing to us on YouTube. And also click the bell for notifications to follow in and join in on all the weirdness that we have. And of course, visit our website, nightmare365.com. They can keep up with all of our information, our shows, videos, everything else. Today, we are talking with Mark Nesbitt from Ghost of Gettysburg. And we're opening up the Eerie Falls for this one, Case File 45. It's all about ghosts, paranormal, everything like that. So let's start the show. Welcome to Nightmare 365. This is the center of weirdness for the entire planet. There's tons of unsolved mysteries out there. Witches still exist. What about monsters? Do you believe in ghosts? Bigfoot is not out there. Bigfoot is definitely out there. UFOs are real. UFOs might be real. Do you believe in conspiracies? I consider myself a conspiracy theorist. I want to believe in all these case files. Trust no one. The government lies to you. We're just two brothers exploring the unexplained, mysterious, and spookiness that lives among us. What's going on, Mark? Welcome to the show. Well, hi. I guess this is Matt. This is Matt, and you're, okay. Greg's here with me, the skeptical sidekick. Yeah, I'm here too. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so uh, I guess a little background on you. You're an author. You do your own research. Um, you were a former National Park Service ranger. And Correct. And I don't know if I'm missing anything else. You have written 14 books, I guess, so far. That's a lot. Uh, on the subject uh, well, of I Ghosts think, in Gettysburg, I, right? I think there are a few more than that. I last lost count at about twenty five, but twenty five um, really because there's some yeah there's some that you know are out of print right now, but uh, for the most part it's either Civil War or uh, uh, Gettysburg or um, the paranormal that I've written on. Uh, I don't know if you got the uh, copy or got a copy of uh, uh, Civil War Ghost Trails. That's the entire Civil War. I got a chance to go to all the major Civil War battlefields. And collect their ghost stories and actually do some paranormal investigating at the different sites. And um, so uh, it covers that. And then, of course, it just came out, as you guys know, with a, with a novel uh, that I've been working on for now. Now, what a, Yeah, I saw that. Yes. It's called uh, Die Again Once More. Is, that, is that the one? So the Die Again Once More gives you a little bit of a hint that there might be some reincarnation weird stuff in there too so but it that actually has to do with a uh, uh s some of the events are actually some of them are, are, are taken from real life i mean um for example um the the i don't know if you guys remember the famous uh elevator scene in one of my uh one of my books the very first book and uh we can talk about it later on but everybody keeps asking me what would have happened if the women actually gotten off of the elevator well i kind of answer that oh nice in, <laughs> yeah in this in this uh, work of fiction well we'll have to explain that story because that was at the the gettysburg college correct that is correct <clears throat> yeah that that was a very interesting story and i did i actually did want to go to the college and and find where that was and and try to see if i experienced anything for myself because because unlike greg i've been to gettysburg Number of times, and every time Greg was supposed to go, listen, it's not my some, fault. Something tragic always happened. Well, maybe it's paranormal. I don't know. That's true. It, 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 something could have been keeping you away from there. I mean, every time we tried to go, I've gotten injured. So I Ooh, don't. That's not good. Yeah. No, it's definitely not. So I don't. I don't know if maybe that's I, something to do with the battle. Maybe you were reincarnated somehow, and then all of a sudden, have you ever told him the story 
about? Uh, me as a bellhop? No. You I, should. Yeah. I. When's the last time I, I talked to you years ago? It feels like now. And then yeah. I guess the last time I actually saw you in person, you know, last time I stopped in Gettysburg, it's been a, a few years now. But uh, Right. Yeah, Greg has an interesting story that dates not to Gettysburg in the particular, which anybody listening to the show has probably heard this a million times. Correct. But uh, up in Salem, there's a picture that's in the hotel, at the Hearthrone Hotel, of an old bellhop from the 1920s. And it looks exactly to the T like yeah. my brother Greg. <laughs> really? Yeah, so really? It, it's kind of interesting. I don't, know, I don't know if we believe in reincarnation, but uh, it, it's something to think about. Yeah, it definitely is. So I wanted to get a little bit, I, I don't know if, you know, the listening audience is, is familiar with your background. We know you're an author. You know you were a former park ranger at Gettysburg. I don't know if you're a park ranger anywhere else. I don't know if I asked you that question before. Uh, I was not. So. I was not at, at, uh, in any other parks. I did, however, apply for what was called a split position, which was uh, would be summertime in Gettysburg and wintertime in the Everglades. Oh, uh, that. that, that's nice. <laughs> yeah, if I had gotten that position, <laughs> right now there would be no ghost books. <laughs> yeah, I mean, no ghost tours. You and I wouldn't be talking right now because I'd, have, I'd probably have retired by now from the park service because that's where all the guys that I started with are doing right now. They're they're retiring out of the park service with a with a pretty nice uh, pension, which I missed. But <laughs> what that's the way it goes. I got a question. How? What made you get into? I guess, like, the field of, like, paranormal and ghost stories. Like, what started it for you? Actually, it was some personal experiences I had at, in Gettysburg. I um, when I, I was, like, the bachelor of, of the park, and so they, they uh, I lived in some of the houses out on the, out on the battlefield, you know, those pretty stone houses and that, that are right on the battlefield. They put park rangers in there for security purposes, and so... Uh, being the bachelor, I got moved around a lot, so I lived in four different houses, and and one, and I had something happen to me in just about every one of them, huh. and the one that really stuck with me was in the National Cemetery Lodge. I lived in in the cemetery there. That's and, pretty sweet. Um, yeah, it actually was actually was very nice. The, the 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 Baltimore Hill, you could hear the trucks going up it, but the rest of the time is, needless to say, pretty quiet. But um. We, I was in there alone, all by myself, and I remember it was daylight, hmm. broad daylight, and I had uh, just picked up my dishes from the dining room table, and I was uncharacteristically taking them out to wash them. <laughs> <laughs> and I uh, got a uh, – all of a sudden, I heard some, from somewhere in the house a baby crying. That's weird. And, uh, you know, when you hear something that's so out of context that you – you know, you try to explain it. I'm like, wait, wait, what the heck was that? Was that a, was that maybe the pipes squeaking? I don't know. No, was it the house settling? No, mm -hmm. that was a that was a baby crying, and I just could not um, uh, explain it away. Later on, I remembered that uh, uh, I'd heard that there was a. Well, I knew that there was a uh, uh, an orphanage two doors down oh, okay. from where the cemetery lodge was built, and that the the lady who ran it, the second lady matron who ran it was a, was like a horrible person. And she'd make the kids stand out, you know, in the, in the cold and stuff like that. But, um, what really happened, what really uh, got me interested in it was like, apparently I mentioned it in the coffee room at one time at the, at the park. Yeah. And the guys in the coffee room said, well, you need to talk to such and such who lived <laughs> there before you. I said, Okay. So I looked her up and I talked to her and I asked her what what happened. She said, I, you know, I heard. She said I heard babies crying in there all the time. She said probably half a dozen times. In fact, one time she said I started to run up the stairs and then stop because I remember, wait a minute, all my kids are grown. They're all in school now. Sure. She said, but I heard it a number of times. Uh, so what? You know, the interesting part is, and and, and I have a chapter in Ghosts of Gettysburg Eight about this. Are the things that happen, the same thing happens in at different times, sometimes years, sometimes months, over and over again to different people. Now, do you think? I, you know, I, do you think like uh, that's um, like a residual? Do you believe in like those like residual haunts, or do you just believe like uh, that they're intelligent? They just reach out to different people, or do you think like I, some people are just more susceptible to that kind of stuff? 
that one I would count, I would call a residual haunting because it didn't it didn't interact with anybody. In other words, maybe because it was a baby, it couldn't. But that one I would call a, a residual haunting, which we have uh, probably more of than than what I would call an interactive or intelligent haunting, which in which the um, the entity or the spirit or the energy, whatever you want to call it, actually interacts with with the living person. In other words, tries to get the person's attention mm -hmm. uh, or speaks to them. And I have a number of those, not as many as just the regular residual. Do you, and you written, I mean, eight just came out. Like, so the Ghost of Gettysburg book, eight one just recently came out. I mean, do you feel like you're going to run out of stories with some of these things? Well, I have a whole, uh, I, I have a whole packet down here at my foot of, uh, of ghost stories about Gettysburg for, for number nine. <laughs> and so it's already um, in the works. I, yeah, it's already in the works, and uh, I, I even, and I have another one that I'd, I'd like to to get out, and um, I don't, I don't know. Tentatively, I think I'd, I'd like to call it Quantum Ghosts, and it's, um, it, it would be a book on, because I do have the research done on it. It would be a book that would kind of t using Gettysburg and maybe other battlefields as gigantic laboratories for paranormal research. Um, in order to try and um, compare different different um, stories and different accounts, and then somehow link them to um, physics, to quantum physics, and there there are many links, and there there are many uh, writers and professors much smarter than I that ha have already made this connection. But I think Gettysburg is it can be. You know, all the stories that I've collected, I mean, probably a thousand uh, just on Gettysburg and maybe another 200, 250 on other battlefields. It certainly is, even though they're anecdotal, there are, like in my case, there are stories that continue to repeat themselves to completely different people who don't even know each other. Um, but it just happens to be Gettysburg. And guess what? It happens over and over and over again. So, yeah, yeah now, I mean, I don't. I'm hoping everybody knows about Gettysburg in itself, you know, where it's located in Pennsylvania and everything. <laughs> but, I mean... I'm sure some people don't. Yeah, I, I'm sure they don't. And it has connections to the Civil War, obviously. It was a three-day battle in July, July 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. And during the Civil War, it was pretty much one of the bloodiest battles, you know. So there is yeah. a lot of, you know, death that it's associated with Gettysburg, you know. And I know we've just been talking about Gettysburg and ghosts, but... It's, it's really much more than that. And that's one of the things I enjoy just going and seeing like the real history that it has, the town itself. And obviously you have a shop right there on Baltimore Street, right in, the, right in the middle of the town, right where the battle was happening. And I guess explain for people that don't know, like what are some things, if you don't know anything about Gettysburg and it's like kind of the first time you're coming into the town, like is, is there's there's certain pieces of a history. Like I know it really well. Greg's never been there. Nope. But like if, if you were like, if Greg's a first timer and he wasn't going with me, I guess explain like besides some of the ghost stuff, which is really great to see. And you do the, the ghost of Gettysburg candlelight walking tours, which I'd done myself. So that was kind of cool. Going to some of the hot spots there, right in the middle of town. But right. is, there, is there something that like when you start off, like how do you explain Gettysburg to somebody? Oh wow, that's uh, that's a good question. Although I've done it millions of times, it, it, Gettysburg is is actually um, was in the middle of the American Civil War, and by many is considered the watershed victory for the Union. They weren't doing too well. The North was not doing too well up till Gettysburg. They were handed a series of defeats from uh, by Robert E. Lee, who was the uh, 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 the Confederate commander um, for a couple of, couple of years before the Battle of Gettysburg, but Gettysburg was one that they were as far north as they were ever going to get with a large army. Um, they were on the verge of British recognition. If that would have happened, then certainly they would have gotten um, uh, money, and uh, they were already getting arms from Great Britain, as was the north. Uh, they were So Gettysburg was really a very, not to get too uh, long-winded here, but Gettysburg was, was a, a watershed victory, but and as well, it was the 
by some accounts, the, the most costly battle uh, in, in um, American history, as a matter of fact. There were 51,000 casualties in just three days. Now, that's killed, wounded, and missing. That's not all, right. that's not all dead. But for one battle that lasted three days, that is an awful lot of people. That's actually, I think, the new Yankee Stadium, for anybody listening to you in New York, that is about 52,000. That's that crazy. That so if you see a, a, a TV program of, uh, well, all you have to do is go to Yankee Stadium, try and get out of the parking lot <laughs> on a baseball game. You find out how, how awful it is to have 51,000 people. You can imagine all of those people uh, either dead or, or helpless drop down on a town of about uh, 2,000, 2,400 people. Mostly women, actually, was kind of cut in half because all the men uh, took the horses and all the dry goods and everything, and and they called call it skedaddled up north of the uh, the Susquehanna River to get out to take their goods, dry goods and everything away from the Confederates. So it was mostly women who were left there to take care of all these wounded, and it was just overwhelming. Every house, every building, every barn, every church, every public building – including the ones on the Gettysburg College campus, it was called Pennsylvania College then, were filled overflowing with wounded, uh, dying men. Um, so if, if there is, and I have theories about this, if there is something left over of us or, or perhaps something that we produce when we die that, that, or, it, or, or in terrific agony that, that bursts from our bodies and, and get stuck or get gets you know surroundings get charged by it certainly gettysburg any of the buildings there would um would have some some of that remnant uh energy in them uh and you know you hear a lot of people saying that, that oh we have the most haunted building in gettysburg well they're all pretty much haunted it's just whether the owners want to talk about it or not you know because i've gotten calls from people who in houses that i've never i never heard before that they'd had any experiences and i look for these things and the people would say you know we've had we've been having some a situation here in our house could you come in and do a do an investigation and i'd never heard that that house had been haunted before so it there there there's a lot going on um but the battle itself was was uh, be, where all that where all that came from i believe now, when you go and do an investigation, like what do you actually do? Well, we do uh, we do it a little bit differently than you see it on TV. Yeah. You know, the the the, the TV guys. It, I, we do what we call intuition forward, where uh, we when we when we're teaching these things, we try and um, get people to be a little more sensitive to their surroundings. Um, uh, Gettysburg kind of kind of jumps you when you when you get there. Uh, Matt, you've been there. Greg, when you get there, I, I'd like to uh, uh, for you to let me know if this happens to you. But people automatically know that they're in a different place hmm. when they get to Gettysburg. And I say it's kind of like, you know, it's kind of like walking into a church. It feels different. I mean, sure. it's just a building, but it feels different. And uh, so that is, um, you know, one of those interesting things that, that, that happens when you get to Gettysburg that um, – it's 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 di just different. It's just different because, and perhaps it's because of everything that happened there. Yeah, I would say when I I go there, I never felt like a sense of dread or anything like sadness. I almost felt like at peace. I I just I guess I enjoy it so much going, learning about uh -huh. the history, trying to figure out like have a ghost sighting myself because I never had an experience like that. Yeah, I would love to have like a sighting or experience like now. Like I, I did when I was little, but I don't really remember that. Yeah, that that's a yeah, that's one of the things. Like when I go, I I just feel like it's it's something that's like a peaceful place to me now. I don't know if that really like resonates with you or you know insight about that, but yeah, I, I know when people go to certain places, they say they feel heavy, you know, they feel sadness. I never felt that when I went there as many times as I've been there. Well, I have to agree. I, I really never felt that either when I first were, first started living in Gettysburg. It's just it, it was more like just an awareness that this place is special. It's different. Oh yeah. And uh, I think one of the one of the reasons it's different is because so many people 
suffered and 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 some died there. And certainly, even if you were not wounded or escaped the battle without a without an injury, you look back on it for the rest of your life probably and said, "Wow, was I lucky?" You know, you know. And Gettysburg became an important place for these soldiers really for the rest of their lives because when you read about the reunions and everything that they had on the 25th and 50th and 75th anniversary these guys when it was wasn't easy to travel they would travel hundreds of miles to get back for, to the reunion uh, it just had that kind of a draw Gettysburg had that kind of draw they didn't do that with a lot of other places they didn't do it with Appomattox or or Spotsylvania I mean they did periodically but not as many uh, reunion uh, not as many men went to any of those places as to as to Gettysburg. Now you said you went to like all the other all the other battlefields throughout the Civil War. Like did anyone other than Gettysburg really like touch you just like Gettysburg touched your heart? There were a couple of places oh yeah, yeah, a couple of places, mainly because I knew what had happened there. Um, the, the Spotsylvania, there's a place called the, the Mule Shoe or the Bloody Angle where they fought for 20 or 21 hours straight through the pouring rain. Um, after the battle, they, they would, they'd see a leg sticking up out of the mud and it'd be wiggling. So they'd grab and pull it out, bring a guy, bring a living guy out. Um, others, I mean, you know, I, I don't want to get too graphic, but, but others were just, you know, basically shot to pieces. There was a, uh, and as an example, there was a 22 inch oak tree mm-hmm. that was standing there and it was chopped down by small arms fire. That's the one ounce mini ball that kept, you know, just randomly guys weren't trying to hit the tree. Sure. And a, a 22 inch tree that was chopped down by uh, small arms fire. So it was, it was, pr- in fact, a veteran of um, Spotsylvania and Gettysburg was with the 24th Michigan, which was 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 pretty much decimated at Gettysburg. If you know anything about about the first day there, this guy wrote after Spotsylvania that he said and he said Gettysburg was a skirmish compared to Spotsylvania. Jesus, <laughs> a skirmish. You call it a battle like Gettysburg. So yeah, that's crazy. I mean, yeah. what's what's different about Gettysburg, too, compared to a lot of other battlefields, I mean, even just on, like, the East Coast, was it's the battle happened right in town. I mean, you could still walk down, right. you know, like, Baltimore Street and see some of the remnants of bullet holes and, you know, witness trees, things like that right. that happened in the town itself. Which see, that's I, pretty cool to me. I think it's different than, you know, like, going out to Antietam, where it's just a big open field. And, you know, like, right. all right, something happened here. And which I think is a cool thing, too, about Gettysburg is, you know, you go throughout the battlefield and you could see the battle lines, you know, with all the monuments. And, yeah. you know, you could read about like the troop movements and it was a three day battle. So you could, you know, start on the one side of town, you know, in like the big open field and then get all the way through town to the second day and then all the way pretty much to the last and another big open field and, you know, pickets, Pettigrew charge and. So, yeah, it, it is different. It's a different feel, and it's, it's a different kind of atmosphere. And I definitely recommend anybody who hasn't gone and visited Gettysburg itself, do yourself a favor and check it out. Well, that's, that's kind of why I like our, our tours, because they're kind of they, – we tell the history of the site first. It's in town. I mean, I remember I was a tourist there at one time, and we, I didn't even know there was a town of Gettysburg until years later after we first started <laughs> coming. You know, it's the battlefield. Yeah. And the motel and the swimming pool and dinner and then, you know, TV. But um, we actually, you know, it's, uh, talk about what happened in town and, and, and talk, talk about the history first and then tell the ghost story. So um, that's why I like our tours. Yeah, well, this but, has uh, been. Yeah, Gettysburg's impo- the town of Gettysburg is very important in the whole scheme of, of the history. Yeah, it is. And this is, this is actually your 25th anniversary, right, this year of doing the Ghost of Gettysburg candlelight walking tours? Way to make me feel real old, Matt. I mean, <laughs> yes, you've been doing this for years. 25 years, so that's crazy. I can't believe it. That is awesome. I, I know. And you were were you in the like the same building like throughout the whole time, or when did you purchase the building on Baltimore Street? Because supposedly we, that is 
you know, has its ghost stories as well. Your headquarters. Yes. Um, yeah, we, we uh, bought the place in 97 so and started the tours in 94. So it was about three or four years after uh, the, uh, the tour started. But and, and actually, I asked the, the tenants that were in there at the time, I said, have you seen any ghosts here since I'm going to start my business? And they were like, well, no. In other words, a lot of people are reluctant to talk about it. Uh, yeah, why is that? We had we were talking about this on one other podcast. Like, why do you think people are so reluctant to talk about like their ghost either experiences or say that they believe in ghosts or even like UFOs or any, anything paranormal? I think they're a little bit afraid of ridicule, you know. And uh, for example, when I was with a with a park. Uh, we had so many people come in and ask about ghosts that we finally asked our bosses, you know, what should we tell them? And they sent down a memorandum later on, so tell them that there are no such things as ghosts and we don't have any here at Gettysburg, which leads me to believe, <laughs> you know, when the government is denying something. Sure. You know, <laughs> there's got to be something. It there, always comes right? back to the government, man. That's it. That's right. And so in the meantime, that's why I coll started collecting these stories after my experiences there to uh, to document them. And to me, they're... They're 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 a type of history. They're folklore, mm -hmm. you know, which is a type of history. Of course, and they needed to be. I think they needed to be recorded as well. So, but I think the reason pe that's one of the reasons why people are a little bit um, reluctant to talk about them because they're afraid. You know, even if the government, you know, the government's saying there's no such things as ghosts, why should I say anything about it? But uh, but still, in all the people that I get letters <coughs> from people still to this day saying i came to gettysburg this past summer i've never had a paranormal experience experience in my life and here's what happened to me <laughs> so <clears throat> i'm waiting for that day i'm waiting for the next time i go to gettysburg i'll be doing the uh see would you rather see a ghost or a ufo that's tough man that's tough for me i don't know huh. maybe i mean a ghost on one hand because then you think about like the afterlife that's that freaks me out. Yeah, or then you have like the UFO where it's like, all right, there's more to us than just just this little patch of land. Now, Mark, we had we had another podcast too about like death and the afterlife and everything. What mm -hmm. do you what do you think happens? Because I get freaked out about this when I think about this. Yeah, don't go into too much detail because Greg is definitely going to get freaked out. <laughs> like I woke up one night, I don't know why, maybe I was dreaming or something like that. And I couldn't fall back to sleep because I was thinking about, like, when I die, like, what's going to happen? I mean, well, that's that's a good question. I, I the only thing the only way I can um, answer that, since I can't answer it from experience, <laughs> is that it I, I, I do believe that there is remnant energy that is is in us and you know it kind of depends on whether there is you know whether whether the mind is the seat of consciousness or whether consciousness is a separate part of our brain from our brain going deep and, mark of course, pardon going deep on this one <laughs> i like it well it's it's a huge you know everybody talks about it and everything and and some people seem to think that consciousness uh that are that are brains that are that our brains are not so much libraries, but more like radios, where some of us can fine tune our radios in our brain to pick up on the ultimate consciousness that's out there. The Akashic field is what Edgar Casey called it. Um, the uh, collective subconscious, which is what um, uh, Carl Jung called it. So this is this is, you know. If there is indeed a separate consciousness from our brains, um, Greg, I think that's where we go. I mean, you know, we we shed this mortal coil, this this body that uh, keeps breaking down, or like in your case, getting injured before you go to Gettysburg. <laughs> we we shed this, and then we then we move into the the the, the ultra consciousness, and I think that's a that's a. Um, if if there's anything that goes on after life, yep. that's where it goes on, and we can, obviously, kind of go back and forth. In other words, use our consciousness, our our, our thought form of what we once were, yeah, and show up again. Now, do you are you going to do that on, to Gettysburg? 
if you had the power like could are you going to you think you're going to do that to get if I'm going to return to Gettysburg? Yeah, wh- you think you're going to return to Gettysburg? I'm, no, I'm I'm going to Disneyland, man. Disneyland. <laughs> all right. Disneyland. All right. <laughs> you know like the, all the football players. You know, where where are you going? I'm going to Disney <laughs> Disney World, I guess. I go to Disney World. But uh no, I uh I, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, like Who what, knows? what was like the draw something. besides were you local? always living in the area and then you kind of just like lucked out to get a job at Gettysburg and then collect all these stories or it was, it something that you wanted to seek out. This was like just something that you enjoyed as whether like civil war history or anything like that. Yeah. Yes. To all of those. I grew up, I did not grow up in Gettysburg. I grew up outside of Cleveland and had gone to Gettysburg with my uh, parents as a tourist. And it was a summer before my senior year in college and I had been working construction for my dad, and it just got to the point where, you know, I, I got I, I'm tired of this. I'm going to just apply. You know, I'll pump gas in Gettysburg, but I'll just apply to the National Park Service to see what happens. And I was lucky because that was one of the turnover years where the, the seasonal employees from last year, a bunch of them didn't want to come back, so I got, I got hired. And I guess it was in my second year or beginning of my second year where – uh, I picked up what's known as a 180-day appointment, which is basically all year round. So in the wintertime, I became a, a an enforcement ranger. But then in the summertime, I gave talks, and which is which is great. That that to me was the best job uh, in the park, in the National Park Service, is being a seasonal uh, or in, what they call interpreter. So I gave right. talks on every single um, battlefield of of the three-day battle and then the cemetery walks and civil war soldier talks i gave talks as a dressed as a civil war soldier rode a horse for several years <laughs> as awesome. a as a cavalryman and as a as a ranger patrol it was a pretty good job i mean you know for a guy in your 20s yeah no for sure being out in gettysburg must have been a nice you know to like wake up every day and you know kind of that's your that's your office is the battlefield and i mean you really yeah. have like the whole town to to go and do it but uh getting back to because i don't think we explained it but getting back to the gettysburg college incident where you wrote about it in the book oh yeah, yeah. Let's where, talk about this yeah i don't know if greg ever heard the story i, I mean i read your books but uh yeah this this story is i mean i'll let you explain it more than anything else like describe what happened because it is after all what like a creepy story that's that should just be like on a weekday weird just the yeah. story itself talking about it yeah well the story came to me from uh some college students and i actually tracked down the people that it happened to because I, they were actually administrators or friends of mine but at any rate the uh the what happened is one one night uh, two women, female administrators were working late in pennsylvania hall which is now the administration building for gettysburg college at the time of the battle it was one of the largest buildings in the area and became a hospital the lower floors were used for the operating rooms and the upper floors for recovery. Um, so these women, the, being the 1980s again, were working late, and they decided, okay, it's time to – time to. it's 11 o'clock. Let's pack it in. So they got on the elevator in Pennsylvania Hall and pressed the button for the first floor, which is where the exits are. The elevator went down and we actually went past the first floor, and they're thinking, oh, this thing's malfunctioning again. The doors opened in the basement to a, a scene that was completely off the charts. It was a hospital, Civil War hospital scene that they looked into. Uh, men in, in bloody corners of the, of the area slumped down. There was an operating makeshift operating table down there. A, a surgeon in a bloody apron. He had a saw. There was a guy on the table. I mean, they and they were panicking. They were pressing the button, trying to get, and a button wouldn't work to close the doors. Um, finally, it the doors closed, and went up to the first floor. They immediately ran over to the to the security office to report this. And I went ahead and interviewed the the security guy that was on uh, duty. He says, "Oh yeah, yep, they were scared to death. They were, but we went over there." He said, "I figured it was a fraternity that was playing some kind of prank." Got into in there we got on the elevator went back down the doors opened and the area was pristine all painted white like it always had been he said 10 feet and i've been down there and 10 feet from the uh uh opening of the elevator is like a 
a cinder block wall that has all the electronics on it and everything, and the cages that hold all the uh, the, the the paper and, and and stuff like that. So he said, I you know I don't know what happened there. Now the interesting part about it is I was doing autographing several years after the book came out with um, at Gettysburg College, and a couple came up and they were like, you know, we know the woman that happened to that elevator thing. I said, oh, you know, such and such. And they're like, no. So we must know such and such. The other one, no. And I said, wait a minute. Talk to me. <laughs> they told me a story about a, another woman who was not employed by the college. She was doing, she was with a, a, an accounting firm doing an audit. She was up on the fourth floor. And I said, this is, this is daylight now. And they asked her could, if she could go down and get some papers in the car. So she got on the elevator, down she went doors opened in the basement to the same scene. I called her up. She actually moved to Denver. So I called her up to interview her. She told me exactly the same, other than that she was not working for the college, the exact same story. And I'm like, what is going on here? That's two, three people that have experienced that. And I'm trying to track down a, a fourth one that, that I've, I've gotten a, a, a lead on. So that means this thing is happening over and over and over again, or at least, a couple of times. So when, when I, t when I have that, when I'm talking about that story and people ask me about it, they, the, probably the second question they ask is what would have happened to these people if they got off the elevator? That would be, yes. I want to know too, like, obviously yeah. this was a while ago, but also can, like, if I went there just as a tourist, can we go into some of these buildings? Or well, no? that, I, you know, I, I, like I'm not a student. To, I'm just like walking yeah. around and want to want to go down in this basement now. Like I have Mark's book. Have I want to find this. <laughs> you might have to get permission because it is, you know, it's not a public area, but it's right. not. I mean, students and administrators go in and out all the time too. Right. So. Yeah, I mean, I would probably like. I mean, I always see security driving around, so I'd be like, "Listen, right. I'm just a tourist. You know, I read this book. You know, have you ever seen anything crazy, weird?" And then I, I, I can give them, like, one of the Nightmare 365 business cards and be like, we're doing research. Yeah, I wonder if, yeah. like, the security guys have, like, I'm, I'm sure you've talked to them, the security people there, if right. they have experiences right. more yeah. than, like, the average person. Well, I've written about them, too. There are a couple of, of uh, security guards that that uh, I collected their stories. They're, you know, it's, it's they're always kind of circumspect about it. Um just like everybody else, they they don't want to they don't want to admit, you know, that they that they had an experience like that. I know we were doing a, 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 a an event down at Stratford, which is um, the uh, the boyhood home of Robert E. Lee, mm -hmm. and that place is haunted. And um, one of the security guards was pointed out to me who has had many, many, many experiences there. Um, in fact, seeing full-bodied apparitions moving out in the fields and in, 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 in buildings and stuff. But the word was he probably won't talk to you until after he's retired. You know, That's he a had shame. a couple more years. And he didn't want to talk about it until after he was retired. So. Uh, you could just put it, like, anonymous and you yeah, know, just right. say, like, you know, this is – Jeffrey from, you know, yeah. he used to work there. He used to work there. I mean, I get yeah. it. People don't want to be, you know, that you go into work every day and be like, oh, you're the, you're the goose guy, you know, like, oh, you believe in ghosts if you don't, if you don't particularly, you know, believe in that stuff. So I get it. But also like we, we now live in a day and age where it's become mainstream, especially yeah. like, you know, it's always on TV. Like you, you always see these shows Ghost Hunters, Ghost Adventures, Ghost Lab, Ghost This. Great ghost. segue, Greg. Well, I'm just saying. Greg like, always wanted to ask you about Ghost Hunters when you were on. I think oh, it yeah. was, this was years ago now, but like the 150th anniversary, the Ghost Hunters team came. Uh -huh. like, right. Yeah, what was it? Jason Hawes and Steve and Tango right. and all them. Right. So H how was that like being on that show? Well, uh, I think Jason and, well, let me put it this way. I've worked with them before, and uh, I think that they have a pretty good um, protocol for only airing what they think or can can at least reasonably 
uh, demonstrate that it's authentic. Mm -hmm. uh, because, and this is my own experience, they, when I was the client, okay, um, <laughs> yeah, they I were trying that. to find child ghosts in Gettysburg. And uh, so they went to a couple places. Then they came back and reviewed, did the reveal with me. Uh -huh. And uh, what what you saw on TV was not everything they got. They had gotten a couple of things that I looked at. And I said, you know, guys, I don't think that's I, I don't think you got anything there because I know that place and I know the shadows and this and that. And I don't think that's I mean, it could it, it might be something paranormal, but it, it also could be just the shadow of a truck or of something driving by. Mm -hmm. So they didn't put those on. I mean, they didn't try and convince anybody that something I said was not authentic was authentic. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? They they so I kind of. I, I like I like their their protocols and I like the way they 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 actually did that didn't didn't put something on that was that was possibly phony. Mm -hmm. So I think they do a pretty good job. Uh, of course, they're not on anymore, um, but um, well, I always yeah. enjoyed working with them. Yeah, I mean, we enjoyed watching them for the years that we did, and they were on for what like eleven, twelve seasons, maybe even yeah, more. about yeah, about that. So. I mean, that's the same thing. Like what I always ask you, I mean, there's always experiences. There's always people coming to town and having these experiences, but just kind of writing about like these ghost stories after a while, you know, like you would think it would run out, but then like, you know, when you go there as a new visitor and then people have their experience and it can be totally different than what's been going on. And I guess that's what I wanted to ask too, is like, do you, do you believe like a lot that goes on in Gettysburg is more residual, like it just keeps playing over and over again there? Or, you know, do you get accounts of just like different stuff? Like obviously we know at the Gettysburg College where a couple people had that elevator experience where that could be like residual and it's just something that kind of happens every now and then. But then like new stories, like, I don't know, by the Jenny Wade house, people might see, you know, the only civilian to actually die during the battle or, you know, go out to Pickett's Charge or little round top and then you know you never heard an account at this particular spot but now all of a sudden now all of a sudden you know it's become like a hot spot so to say for ghost activity well those those seem to move around quite a bit i mean one year i heard spangler spring was really really active with a lot of shadow people and shadow things the little scurrying things that you could see Ooh, out demons. there um well, I don't know about <laughs> I don't know about demons. But, That's just yeah, the first thing that pops in my head. Yeah, maybe yeah. elementals or or whatever. But 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 um, uh, that being said, I think the two places that probably have the most consistent activity would be would be Devil's Den and um, the Triangular Field, which is right next to it. Right. And and there there could be reasons. I mean, there's so much granite exposed there at Devil's Den. And of course, granite holds quartz, and quartz it seems to be the master crystal. Uh, in other words, uh, it's basically what is 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 running the phone I'm on, you know, and and what what captures those little electronic ones and zeros in my computer sitting in front of me here, uh, sil silicon, and that's. Um, you know what? What? So it doesn't seem too crazy to think that maybe all those, all that quartz at Gettysburg, because that same kind of rock is two feet under the ground, just below the plow line, um, that they may, that may have captured some of the residual activity there. Now the other kind of activity, the uh, the the the, the, the um, intelligent uh, or interactive, is a little bit different. I, that's one of those things that may come from that that huge consciousness that may be out there. The, there might be a, a, a leak between the, that dimension where the consciousness uh, resides and our uh, brains or our, because we have to sort of facilitate it, you know? Yeah. Uh, humans are, are a vital part. Living humans are a vital part of a lot of these things, not only just to observe it, but to perhaps, you know, help, help open that 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 dimension to uh um the dimension across which uh the consciousness can go but as far as stories i mean you know i like i said i still get them i don't get them quite as as much as i used to but i've never even written about any of the uh investigations that we've done that's a whole 
that's a huge book because we've been doing them for. Are you going what, to write a book about them? Well, I would like to, but it's going to be completely different, you know, than than the Ghosts of Gettysburg series. That's that's kind of like a formula that that people like, mm-hmm. and the investigations. Uh, now, some of them are 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 truly, really, truly frightening if you were not a, a paranormal investigator. Uh, but some of them are just, you know. But we we get EVP. Some of them are just kind of run of the mill investigations. With of course, if 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 recording sounds that you cannot hear, if you recording them on a recorder, the sounds you can't hear. If that's just ordinary run of the mill, so be it. But uh, that's what we, that's what we have a lot of photographs, lots of photographs. So we may, I may do a couple of books on that eventually. Now, do you hear, um, Mike, like, I don't know, like at night or even during the day, do you hear like the cannons or even gunfire? Some people have, some people have heard, uh, cannons, uh, musketry. I heard a drum down in Devil's Den, uh, just four beats, okay, and then it stopped. And I was with someone, and I said, did you hear that? And they were like, yeah, I heard a drum. Huh. And I expected to hear more because when I was, having been a drummer when I was in high school, a drummer just can't, you know, tap out four beats and then stop. They got to noodle around a little bit with it, but never heard it after that. Um, but people have heard cheers, large numbers of men cheering, coming from the woods. Um, I would love to camp horses. out there. I really would. Pardon? I would camp love to out. just camp out in on like the battlefield. I know you can't, yeah. but, you know. Yeah, it's illegal. But, uh, hey, there are <laughs> campgrounds that uh, are are as close to the battlefields you can get. There's there's one out on, on the Fairfield Road, and, of course, that was the retreat route for the entire Confederate Army mm-hmm. marching out that. And, and horses have been heard. Going by large numbers of horses, you look out. I, I had a friend who who lived out on the East Cavalry Battlefield, and she heard. Uh, she said it's like sound like hundreds of horses trotting by, and she looked out as the middle of the night. She looked out, she couldn't see anything, but she heard them. So people do hear a lot of that, a lot of that stuff. Hmm. Guess one thing I would love to experience. Do you think there's a, I guess one general or person that may keep coming up in some of like your investigations or your research that like people hear or talk yeah. about like say you know it the, was the general that i think i can identify as one of our ghosts uh is john reynolds All he right. was the highest ranking union officer to die in the battle he was there he got he got his was getting his men in line he was there about 15 minutes he just gotten on the battlefield and he took a bullet to the back of the head, and it killed him instantly, virtually instantly. And uh, he has he's shown up a number of times in, in various uh, uh, stories that I've gotten uh, in different places where he his body was taken. Um, he was seen by a number of people. In fact, I just found another letter from a, a guy who had seen this uh, at the what's known as the George George House down on Steinwell Avenue, which is business Route 15 there. Um, people have, have seen a general officer lying in this house and there were, and always accompanied by a woman who's sitting there with tears in her eyes, you know, and reading the Bible and crying. And the next day they go to that building and there's, it's, it's filled with, with um, a business. And there's no cot. There's no obviously the the, the scene is completely different. Uh, he's also been seen at uh, the, the the seminary up there on Seminary Ridge, and uh, one of the uh, some of the seminarians have seen him, and uh, so and they pretty much identify who it is. So from pictures. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah and he was he was the guy in the first first day of the battlefield. You know, like the well right. the battle, and then happened. And I guess he is that marker where he died or got shot exactly yes. kind of where it happened in that field. Well, yeah, or close, close, close enough. You know, I mean, yeah, the the let me put it this way: apparently, the people who are with him uh, located that, so it's as close as they could 
I mean, after remembering, yes, 15, 20 years, as close as they could get to, to where they thought it happened. Oh, that's interesting. I'll have to go explore over there a little bit more next time. It's kind of like all these all these stories is kind of getting me excited to yeah. go back and. and uh, kind of I don't know if I want to commit to going back. Nah, yeah. you, you're not gonna come. He, I don't think Greg will ever come to the battle. I would like to, but I just don't want to get hurt. You know, if I say <laughs> I'm gonna come and then boom, something happens again. I, I told you you could wheel me around there. <laughs> I told you I would like the first time it happened. <laughs> I wouldn't mind, you know, there's a lot to uh, see, but we could drive around, do the audio tour, things like that. So, yeah, this is one topic I, I think, like, just with you ghosts could talk about our, hours. Yeah, just hours. trying to pick your brain, but I, I definitely recommend any. One of my favorite books that you writ, uh, wrote, sorry, um, is the, uh, the Ghost Hunter's oh. Field Guide, Gettysburg and Beyond. Right. I, I enjoyed that one. Oh, thanks. Yeah. That I mean, it was, uh, people kept asking me, where's the most haunted place? And how do I get there? And, <laughs> and, uh, how do I investigate it? So I just, I wrote about the different places on the battlefield burial sites, you know, uh, that may or may not still hold bodies. Um, the, um, uh, you know, where it's likely gave them, gave some hints and tips on how to do a paranormal investigation. So that was fun to do. Yeah, and just like the other, go I mean, you have just compiled so many stories of, you know, that just just been out there from the public and, you know, your experience and other people's experiences. And I don't know, like, <laughs> give a tip for somebody that wants to have an experience. <laughs> Matt really wants to have yeah, an experience. I really do. You need to just go to Gettysburg and just camp out. Just camp out there until you have an experience. It's and bound to happen. I'm sure it doesn't work that way, but you, you got to be open to it. Maybe you're not open to it. Maybe I'm not. Maybe I, I I want to say that I want this experience, but down deep inside, I, I probably don't. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. Is there? Well, you know, you, you could try uh, getting EVP, and sometimes you get peripheral experiences. For example, in, in my building, I, I would try and get EVP in the very back room, second floor, because that's the oldest part of the house. And almost always, well, not almost always, they want... Every other time I was getting EVP, uh, my back would be to the kitchen that's up there, and I would hear footsteps coming across the floor. And so I'd finish the EVP, and I'd turn around and thought it might be Carol coming up to tell me something, or, and nobody was there. So I just kind of – and finally I was like, this is happening too often. So I, 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 I stopped the EVP after I'd heard the footsteps. Nobody was there. I said, did anyone else in this room – the half a dozen people – Anyone else hear the footsteps in that other room? And they're all like, yeah. We thought somebody was coming over to talk to you. I said, no, nobody's coming over there. And one guy said, that's funny because I saw someone looking over your shoulder. My back was to the door. He said, I saw somebody looking over your shoulder to see what you were doing. I said, I'm glad you didn't tell me. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I might have hightailed it out of there. But well, that that was, you know, so things things happen and sometimes when you don't when you least expect them to yeah it's a thing and and just like you know like in an administrator building now you just kind of go down into your normal routine and then open up the door and you're right smack in the middle of a hospital i would love to see that see that's what i i always wonder what people visualize or what people you know see i mean does it look so it has to look so real that these people are believing you know what they're seeing or I almost equate it to almost you go into like another dimension. Maybe, you know, what we think of is in the same realm, but in just another dimension. And you just like kind of open up that door literally and figuratively, you know, open up that elevator door and you're in that time or that place or wh whatever it may be. And because I always want to see like, what do these people see? when they see something like that. And same thing like with your story where like the guy saw something behind you. It, you know, you see these pictures and you see like what movies shows and, and depicts of like what these ghosts look like. They're almost transparent and you kind of get a good understanding of what they are. But then you hear like, you know, when you're reading your books and then you're, you're see, you know, like trying to visualize in your head, you almost visualize it as you would see like on any other given day. You know, like when Greg's standing right across from me at this table as we're talking, like, do I see something like that? Or is it really something that's transparent, but you still see plenty of detail? 
Well, you know, I, I think that, the, you know, the, the, it's in the eye of the beholder, obviously, you know, and you have to determine whether this looks, you know, whether this is real, even though it's out of time and out of reason, you have to determine, does this look real? And I think the key to the people, uh, especially the, the first two women that I recorded um, their event, they felt it was so real that they ran over to and reported it to security that somebody if somebody was doing something over there then they shouldn't have been in there so that's how they saw that and and you know you can't you you know when when you are uh, compelled to act because it's something you've seen i mean it's real right it's real yeah that and that's the thing like you always see like when people do investigations you know whether it's on tv or you experience them because, I mean, we talked to one of our good friends, and we had him on the podcast. He's also, um, I guess you would say, an investigator. And some of the evidence that he showed us, you know, you kind of see the same, I guess you would say that you would see the same thing, almost like orbs, shadows, shadow figures, you know, these mm-hmm. outlines of things. And then some of the, you know, like the EVPs are very compelling. But then, like, I always put it in, you know, my mind as like, all right, when those two women open up that, you know, the elevator door opened, and they see this scene. I don't visualize them seeing, you know, like kind of the pictures that we're used to seeing. And that's why it's always like trying to wrap my head around that sometimes. It, it's kind of difficult because I never had that experience, you know, but at the same time, it's, it's, it makes for an amazing story. And I, I want to know. <laughs> and I guess that's like really all I have. I mean, there's nothing that I can really further explain, you know, yeah. some of these episodes or what these people see and like you said you made a good point like it is in the eye of the beholder you know maybe we have subconsciously something like when you referenced that in the beginning of the show something that's that we can see or we can only see you know like why did greg have an experience when he was a little kid and i didn't you know we're right. we're brought up on the same roof you know kind of had the same experiences throughout life and then you just you know one person sees it the other person could only kind of imagine what they saw well i think that that speaks to the differences even brothers i mean are different uh even twins are different you know they may uh, have the same uh genes or similar genes but as far as the the brain or the ability to tune in to these things we're all different yeah so you know i don't that may explain it at least it does to me now did you ever have an experience that really freaked you out that stands out, maybe? Yeah, yeah. The one I always refer to is something that happened to me at a place called the Daniel Lady Farm. And um, this is uh, several years ago. I, uh, the Daniel Lady Farm was a hospital, it was a Confederate hospital. Uh, I belonged to an organization, the Gettysburg Battlefield Preservation Association. They bought the place, and they had restored it. And um, I knew that the next day they were bringing in uh, uh, some Confederate reenactors to, you know, show them around that it was a Confederate uh, hospital site and everything. The front room had the southern exposure, so we assumed that it was uh, the uh, operating room, not to mention the fact there are blood stains, you know, 145-year-old blood stains back then that they couldn't get out of the wood on the floor. Mm -hmm. So uh, I got a call from the caretaker one day. And he said, Mark, if you want to see a paranormal event happening right before your eyes, come on out. Come on out. Hmm. Who could pass that up? Right? right, yeah. So I threw the gear in the, in the van, and I went out there. And I had my video camera rolling when I walked in. And I was like, what's up? He says, I, you know, this room we had cleaned up immaculate so that when the reenactors were in, this was yesterday, they would really be a, uh, really like it. So it was clean yesterday, but look what happened. And he opened the door. And I walked in, and there on the floor were streaks of a rust-colored liquid and some, like, a clear serum that was coming out from around it, plus drops of this rust-colored liquid that looked like they were forming um, crystals in it. And I immediately looked up to the ceiling and to see if a pipe had burst, and sure. it was all whitewashed. And I asked him, I said, what the, did uh, a, a pipe break in the basement? He says, no. He says, that's the first thing I checked. He said, these just appeared this morning. 
I said, what in the world? So I, I, you know, I did an investigation. I got a yardstick. I took pictures. I videotaped the thing. Then I said, do you have a, a, a tissue? Can I take a sample of this? He said, there, yeah, sure. We got some tissue and we dipped it in there. And uh, I took it out. I said, I, you know, I'm done here. I, my work is done. I've documented all this. I don't know what to do. He said, I got to get out to the field. I got, he had some work to do out in the field. He says, I don't know what I'm going to do about this. Mm-hmm. He said, I said, well, I don't know either, but good luck. So I left. <laughs> about two hours later, he, he had come in from the field and he, he uh, uh, called me up again and just said two words. It's gone. What? I said, what? He said, it's disappeared. I said, there's no way. He said, come on out. So I jumped in the car, <laughs> and to, and Carol was with me, my wife. We got out there. Once again, I had the video player going, walked in, and walked into the room, and, and I looked down, and there was absolutely no trace of it. And uh, I'm videotaping, and, and he said, he squatted it down, and he, and he ran his fingers. He said, it was right here, right? I said, yeah. And he went, so what the hell? He had on his fingertips, he had a thin coating of dust. It, it, it was that dry. Okay. And I'm like, what in the world ha- just happened? And, and Carol said, gee, I wonder if a sample disappeared too. So she ran out to the car. Oh, yeah, true. And she, yeah, and she pulled it out. She said, it's still here. Look. And sure enough, there was the, the tissue with the, with the uh, rust brown stain on it. So he says, I, he says, I don't know how to explain this. I don't know what's going on here. But the Gettysburg Battlefield Preservation Association is, pretty, Association is pretty well connected. So we got the sample and sent it to a forensics lab. And three weeks later, uh, the report came back of what the substance, substance was. The substance, the liquid, was blood, and the species was human. Huh. Wow. And this was, I mean, I'm talking like it somebody looked like somebody killed a chicken in there. There were like four or five of these rows. In fact, I have photographs of them in my, and I guess it's Ghost of Gettysburg 7. Now, what the heck happened? Was I in some kind of reverse time warp? Um, well, that's the, that's the thing that I like to talk about with like when people see these apparitions. You know, can they see in another dimension? Could like, you know, that door open or it yeah. could be something i don't know like what time of year it was i don't know if it was summer and you know we know wood is very porous could have been like something that like the heat kind of opened it up and then all of a sudden you know like sucked it back in like the upside down like the upside down world <laughs> no but uh, yeah yeah like those are the, kn- those are the kind of things that run through my mind all the time because i'm i'm like on the fence sometimes like i mean i you know bust greg about being the skeptical sidekick but also, uh, you know, I'm very skeptical of myself because I always want to well, want to see something. But then at the same time, like, how do I explain this? You say to yourself, yeah, maybe that could have happened. But what about all the other blood stains in the room? Right. Yeah. You know, they didn't do that. They didn't become liquid all of a sudden. And, you know, the other ex- uh, people say, well, he came, you know, the guy came in, and cleaned it all up. Right. I'm like, well, wait a minute. How about how about the, the dust? 45, 150 year old blood stains that are still in the wood. I mean, you can't. You just don't clean that. Up. Yeah, no, you it's true. I mean, it stains the wood for hundred. Do you have Do you have that video? Still? Uh, yes, I do. As a matter of fact, somewhere I, I have the photographs. To, I would love I to see that video. Of Ghosts of Gettysburg Seven. Well, we'll have to. We'll ask Mark if uh, one time if we go out, if we get Greg out there one time, we'll do like an investigation with you. We'll put it up. That and we'll be, film it. That would be yeah. awesome. And maybe we could set that up one day and do it. Yeah, because yeah, that's that's something sure. like because we're we're not the. I mean, we've been on investigations with other people. You know, we even went out with like the two guys, uh, Steve and Tango from the Ghost Hunters, on an investigation, right. which we did have an experience. Yeah, we did sort of. Yeah, but uh, it's more or less that we're not this avid kind of go out and you know with all this equipment and kind of seek we're all we're like at the back end we like the stories we like we to talk like about stories. it and you know i mean we would love to have our own experience but at the same time you know we would need somebody like under your tutelage you know to kind of teach us and show us like what to look for what not to look for and you sure. know come at like a skeptical point of view but i got uh, i got one question one grace one question do you believe in bigfoot yeah where did that come from? Do well, I believe in Bigfoot? Yes. <laughs> I, you know, I, I, once again, there's so many reports out there. You have to say, well, you know, 
not everybody's crazy, you know, not everybody's making it up. Not everybody's doing it to get on TV. So there may be some kind of uh, he, creature out Mark there. Mark may you know, believe in Bigfoot. Matt's a big yeah, believer in Bigfoot. Be. I love, I mean, I it love the story of Bigfoot. And uh, yeah, on our new weekday weird on Wednesday, we have a another story about Bigfoot coming out. So yeah, I think this is a, a topic and I think... Yeah, we got to get Greg to come here. I yeah. mean, maybe Mark could, uh, like, entice him. <laughs> I know. definitely do got to go there. I think yeah. it would be – like, I, I do love history. I mean, you know that. Um, a more, you know, American I, I, revolutionary history, but, I mean – I think Greg might – I think he would be more susceptible to having experience than I would and maybe, like, getting him out there. Because I'm more open-minded? I don't know if you're more open minded. You're oh, you're the one who's open minded when you you don't believe in me, have my theories. You believe Bigfoot lives in a cave. No, I said that it's a possibility it that it lives in caves. <laughs> yeah. But <laughs> you know, stuff like that. But yeah, like you said, you know, like that some people are, you know, more susceptible or more open minded or, you know, can have these experiences where this guy. Well, I'm just saying because you had these experiences. I yeah. had, you know, I, I don't know. I've had experiences, but not a, not like to ex- my level. Yeah, I guess not to your level or Mark's level. So yeah, that's where I would need some, you know, like assistance with some of this stuff, huh? But uh, well, we can we can do something. Sure, it's it's you know it's a, uh, we can get some dowsing rods in your hands. We can get some pendulums in your hands. That's that's what I call uh, the the uh, intuition forward. That's stuff that humans actually can can touch. And you can control. You can say, well, how could this pendulum be going around because I'm not moving? Right. Uh, sure. Or how could, the, how could the dowsing rods be crossing when I'm not moving them? And um, whereas, you know, there are other experiments we could try that, that, I, that, I've, that I've done where I've asked uh, them to uh, light up a, a, an EMF meter and it's, they light it up. you got to convince them, you know, it's not going to burn them because the only light they're used to is flame. So, you know, it's, it's, um, there's a lot, a lot of ways to do it. You try one way. If it doesn't work that night, you try a different one. Now, are you, um, planning on anything big this, I know, coming season for your 25th anniversary? Yeah. Well, actually, we'll have to come out and celebrate. On, yeah, we're working on that right now. We're working on some special, uh, deals, special events, uh, that I really can't talk about right now, but there will be something for our 25th. Oh, I like but that. But we are, the next thing that's coming up is on the 26th to the 28th of April, we, uh, uh, Catherine Ramslin, who's been on TV recently, uh, is a friend of ours, and, and, and I wrote, I, I co-wrote two books with her, Haunted Crime Scenes. We have a Haunted Crime Scenes weekend in Gettysburg with the Balladary Inn where we, and that's a haunted uh, uh, B&B. And what we'll do is we'll present uh, the, the participants with the crime, which we don't tell them until they get there. And um, then we teach them different methods of using uh, – well, she teaches the methods of not getting involved in too much uh, biases, like uh, confirmation biases. Mm-hmm. And then we teach them how to, how to investigate the crime using paranormal methods, in other words, intuition, uh, dowsing rods uh, – uh, EVP and that type of thing and try and get more information on the crime to try and solve it. So it's always kind of a fun weekend and people always go away with kind of kind of their jaws, you know, hanging, hanging down saying, I can't believe that happened. But, uh, <laughs> so that's the one thing that we have going on now. There may be a second one where we can get enough people, but our website is where you get the information on that, which is ghosts of Gettysburg.com. Yeah, I'll, I'll link all your stuff up in the show notes too. Oh, and great! Like your, okay, your Amazon page. Great. Yeah, so if anybody wants to see it, uh, whether you know you're watching on YouTube or just like our regular show, which you can get anywhere, uh, it'll be in the show notes. Yeah, you can you get know. all your books there. You can get hats. You know, uh, t-shirts. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Yep. Yeah, yep. I would say, man, we'll have to talk again. Maybe after like Greg, oh, yeah. Greg comes and and you know to Gettysburg with me, or you know we meet up and. We'll talk again about some of the experiences that we may or may not have, but some because I, I think it's just good, you know, even just for the stories, just to go there and like really experience it for yourself. And if anybody, and because all your tour and information is all on that one website, correct? Correct. Yeah, so. that's that gives you all the and the links and other things. But yeah, you're right. I mean, Greg's got to get there because you know it's one thing to read about 
uh, a battlefield or Gettysburg, but it's an, as you know, Matt, it's another thing to be standing right there on the spot where these men stood and to uh, see the battlefield from, from their point of view. It's a whole different mind blowing experience. Well, that's the thing too. Like I, I enjoyed taking your books there too. And you can kind of get a sense of like some of the stuff that, that, you know, is said and experienced through those books. So it's always a good, good tool to have if you're out there in Gettysburg, but Thank you very much, Mark, for coming on, and uh, we'll definitely keep in touch. Great, Matt. Matt and Greg, it's my pleasure, and thanks for inviting me. Anytime. Take care. Have a good night. Okay. You too. Bye-bye. So uh, what would you think, man? Does it entice you a little bit more now to go out to Gettysburg? I mean, it definitely does. I mean, just you know, for the simple fact that he he's so passionate about it. Like, There's so much history. Um, there's so many, obviously, stories about it. Yeah. It definitely does like get you to want to go out there and yeah. experience something for yourself. Well, that's the thing too. I mean, it, it's just something that I, I like where he comes at it. You know, granted, he talks about ghosts and does a lot of that stuff with, you know, his tours. Mm-hmm. I mean, he has people giving the tours, but like just even with his books. True. But he also comes at it, which I like, from like um, kind of a really an investigative background Mm -hmm. i mean granted he wasn't like he said he worked for like the law enforcement part of the national park service for a bit sure but he also comes back from like a history background so he's not giving you like bs sure you know he knows his stuff and like being there and talking to him you know you you kind of get a a good sense all right he knows what he's talking about Mm -hmm. he's had these experiences or he's you know He's talked with, to the people yeah. who have them. And, yep. he's, and he does this research, you know, like he's putting stuff in into the lab and all this. So that's what I like enjoy about just like his his books itself. So I don't know, man. We we definitely have to get you out there for sure. Yeah, I think it would be cool to just to do an investigation with him too. Or just even I want to see that videotape. Yeah. Well I would love I would be like, hey, let, let me see the videotape. I yeah, I I want to see that now too. Because I, I think I did, I think when I did talk to him last time, mm-hmm. whenever it was, I mean, it's been a few years now, he told me that story. And it was one of those things where I want to see it. How do you wrap your head around it? But like the same thing, man, I got to find out if we can go into like Gettysburg College. And because that's one Would thing. Would you just keep riding the elevator up and down yeah. until it happens? <laughs> Playing the elevator game. <laughs> that's you, crazy, yeah. So uh, it's something to think about. I don't know if people out there are listening, you know, believe in ghosts and, you know, what their thoughts of you know the afterlife paranormal ghost activity is and if they've seen it and and one of my big things which like what i said was i want to see what people see like when you open up that elevator it has to be so real it can't be like something that you, you know, know what i equated it to remember the movie the frighteners it was michael j fox like that yeah like that like they walk into a room and it's like basically you're reliving what it was back then that's what I, that's what i pictured at least in yeah, my it's, mind it's not something that you know like you see in the movies where it's just like this transparent figure yeah yeah because it has to be so much more realistic than you know what we see in the movies or what you know we see like these pictures that float around so i don't know but thanks for listening to this week's case file 45 goes to gettysburg with mark nisbet uh, visit nightmare365.com for all of our latest shows videos that we're posting on youtube make sure to subscribe and hit the bell notification for all of our youtube videos because we do you know if you're listening to this just on you know stitcher google play spotify anything like that you could actually watch us and (laughs) yeah and see our 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 weekday weird videos too yeah we get weird we break down the videos and you can see all that so click the bell for notifications subscribe to us and uh keep up with all of our weirdness And until next time, you know what to do. Stay Stay spooky. spooky.